So today we're learning about the internet, social media, and hacking in the 21st century. We have three daily objectives. Number one, explain how states can use technology and the internet as weapons. Number two, explain how private citizens use the internet to challenge states' power. And number three, discuss the limitations of social media in providing news. So first day of this unit we talked about how the United States, through various international organizations, controls the world politically. Two, on the second day of the unit, we talked about how globalization and international trade affects billions of people on Earth every single day. But again, we're talking about countries and states on unit two, or on day two. Here in day three, we're talking about the internet and kind of sticking with our with our state idea. We're going to talk about states and how states use the internet and hacking first. So there are two big state-based hackers here in the world. One is the Chinese, the second are the Russians. Now the Russians are kind of sneaky about it. Check out Vladimir Putin over there saying Shh, he's being sneaky. The other are the Chinese. The Chinese tend to be loud. Let's talk about the Chinese first. China is a developing country. Remember, the primary goal of developing countries is to become developed countries. So a lot of the hacking the Chinese do are hacking privately owned companies. So they may hack Pfizer to steal new ideas for drugs. They may hack John Deere for new ideas in farm equipment. They may hack Boeing to learn about new Air Force aircraft technologies and ideas. So they're going to steal a lot of blueprints uh, about new technologies, new machines, things like that. They're also going to wage economic warfare. So sometimes they're going to hack and just take down websites because that has a negative impact on the economy of the United States. Sometimes they're going to hack and they're going to just straight up transfer millions of dollars from a bank to their own banks. Sometimes it gets even, even more small scale but more complex. Sometimes they ransom things. So they hack your iCloud account and they find all your naked pictures on there and they threaten to send them out to all of your friends on Snapchat if you don't pay them $100,000. These are the kinds of economic warfare that the Chinese use against both countries, for example, stealing fighter jet blueprints, as well as individual people in the developed world. The Russians, again, the Russians are quieter and they're much more specific. The Russians don't really engage in economic warfare hacking. They're more into the political and military side of things. So 2016, so this year, one of the big hacks that have been on the news done by the Russians is they hacked the Democratic National Committee's servers. So the Democratic National Committee is basically just the Democratic Party. Russian government hacked their servers they gained tens of thousands of emails that were sent by people in the Democratic Party to other people in the Democratic Party. So they got access to all that stuff. Illegally, but they got it. And then they released all that stuff to WikiLeaks. And we're going to talk about WikiLeaks in a couple slides. But basically, WikiLeaks is a website that's got stuff on it that people don't want other people to see. So they put... A ton of these democratic emails on WikiLeaks. So now people in the United States can read these emails. And people do. And reporters do. And it's all over the news. And Hillary Clinton and a lot of Democrats are saying that this is this is the reason why they lost the election. They lost the election because Vladimir Putin and the Russians hacked the democratic servers, released democratic emails to the general public, and people saw these emails, saw Democrats as incompetent and stupid because the emails made them look bad because a lot of them weren't very nice. And then people went and voted for Trump instead. Now, Republicans are saying that's not true. The reason Hillary Clinton won is because she was a bad candidate. And maybe that's the truth. I don't know. But that's what the Democrats are saying, and that's what the Russians did. The Russians are using hacking specifically to try and influence U.S. elections. That's a big deal. Stuxnet. We're going to watch a video on Stuxnet after this presentation. Stuxnet is a computer virus that was engineered by the United States and Israel. 
this computer virus existed for one reason, and that is to shut down Iran's nuclear program. This picture here over on the top right shows you what happened. Basically, the United States sent these computer viruses to the area near the Iran nuclear facility. Scientists who worked in for the Iran nuclear facility, they would bring work home. They would plug in flash drives, just like we do. They would plug in their flash drive to their home computer. Their flash drive would get infected by Stuxnet. They would not know it. They brought their flash drives back to work. They plugged it into their work computer sitting in the nuclear facility. Once that flash drive got plugged in, oh, guess what? Now the entire facility has Stuxnet. What Stuxnet did was Stuxnet altered the software that spun the motors of the machines that were creating the nuclear material for Iran's nuclear weapons. And basically, it made them spin either too fast or too slow, depending on the motor. And because it spun too fast and too slow, it did not make the nuclear material that Iran needed to make nuclear weapons. So Stuxnet is a computer virus engineered by the United States of America. They had very, very real political and military outcomes on Iran. It shut down Iran's nuclear weapon program. Now, Iran's nuclear weapon program is still in existence. It is still ongoing. But it slowed it down by somewhere between five and seven years, depending on the analyst you ask. Kind of a big deal. Who knew a virus could have such, a, could have such an impact? on both one country as well as geopolitical relations in the world at large. So we talked about state hackers and basically the state's use of internet. Now we're going to talk about non-state hackers. These guys are often called hacktivists. And the big one is anonymous. You may have heard of it, you may have not heard of it. We're going to watch a video, uh, an anonymous video uh, after the presentation. But anonymous is basically just a group of hackers that do things that they think is right. So the first big hack they did is called Dark Discovery. It was done in 2011. And basically they hacked the information of a lot of people who had child pornography and they put it out on the internet for everyone to see. So everyone knew who had child pornography. These guys lost their jobs. They went to jail. Anonymous did that. These are just guys on computers hacking. The next one was Cybergate. That was against H.B. Gary. H.B. Gary was a company that was trying to figure out who the hackers were that belonged to Anonymous. Uh, of course, this made Anonymous very angry. Anonymous hacked H.B. Gary's website and kind of screwed them over pretty good. Number three was the attack due to Mega Upload. Uh, you guys probably don't know what Mega Upload was, but basically it was like an illegal website where you could go and download movies and stuff. So the federal government shuts down Mega Upload. Anonymous believes that Mega Upload should exist because of freedom of speech. So Anonymous decides to attack websites run by the federal government as retaliation for shutting down Mega Upload. So they shut down the Secretary of State's website. They shut down a whole bunch of different. I think I think they want to. I think I think they shut down the FBI's website. They shut down a whole bunch of government websites um, for a few hours. I mean, it wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, but it but it did send a message. 2015, they actually shut down Donald Trump's website because they decided they didn't like Donald Trump. Shortly thereafter, they decided they didn't like Hillary Clinton, so they messed with Hillary Clinton a little bit. And then they came back and decided they didn't like Donald Trump after all, so these guys are a little crazy. Uh, 2015, remember we learned about the World Trade Organization, the WTO. They decided to hack the WTO's website because they felt like what the WTO was doing was unfair to a lot of different countries. Also in 2015, they actually hacked ISIS website. Uh, they don't like ISIS. ISIS are bad guys. Nobody likes ISIS. Those guys are clearly evil. Uh, so they did hack ISIS. The thing you need to know about Anonymous is that they are very, very decentralized. So nobody knows who these guys are. These guys probably don't even know who these guys are. So one day, Anonymous will say they're for Donald Trump. The next day, they're saying they're for Hillary Clinton. The next day, they're saying they're for whoever else. You never really know, like, is that actually anonymous saying that? Is that a fake anonymous? Is that the real anonymous? They're very decentralized. It's hard to keep up. They wear these crazy masks. There's symbols over here on the back of this laptop. We'll watch this video in just a few minutes. WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is simple. It's a website. 
and it is a website where the public can read classified materials. So before you go and Google WikiLeaks, I want you to understand that it is illegal to read classified documents if you do not have a security clearance to read classified documents. Even if they're on the internet, you can't legally do it. So don't do it. Now, question is, where does WikiLeaks get its materials? Whistleblowers, so guys who work in the federal government who see bad things going on, like people stealing money or just general corruption. Those guys may take some documents or some emails and send them to Julian Assange. That's the guy over here on the right who runs WikiLeaks. And Julian Assange will put it on WikiLeaks, and now the whole world knows because they can go on WikiLeaks and read it. Hackers, so anonymous, the Russian hackers we talked about before. They took all of the Democrats' emails and put them on WikiLeaks. Government officials, so again, whistleblowers, really important guys who see bad things going on and want to stop it. They may leak something to Julian Assange, who then throws it on WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks has both a very good and a very bad reputation depending on who you ask and who they pissed off. Uh, so, you know, take it for what it's worth. Again, do not look up the website. Do not read the documents. The vast majority of them are classified. Do not read classified documents. You can't. It's not legal. Now let's talk about social media. So the big political thing that, the social, that social media did in the last few years was the Arab Spring. So let's talk about the Arab Spring. After 9-11, the United States of America invades Iraq and Afghanistan. This fundamentally destabilizes the Middle East. And the reason it destabilizes the Middle East is because Islamic fundamentalists, we learned about them a couple days ago, they see Christians in the Middle East, a place they consider Muslim land. And that makes them angry. So the, the Islamic fundamentalists, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, all these guys, Hezbollah, they're very upset that you have Christians, Christian countries like the USA. The USA is not a Christian country, but they would consider the USA a Christian country. They see them in what they consider Muslim land. That makes them angry. So that's the number one thing that destabilizes the Middle East. The second thing is, is the United States overthrew a lot of the most important and powerful governments in the Middle East. So we overthrew Saddam Hussein, and we didn't really put a good government in to replace Saddam Hussein. Uh, Syria. We tried to overthrow that guy. We didn't, but the Arab Spring led to it, and we didn't help. Libya, Egypt. So we slowly start overthrowing these guys, and it leaves these huge power vacuums across the region. So we've left these big power vacuums. People have the Internet. They have Twitter. They have Facebook. And for the first time because the region is destabilized, people feel like maybe they have a shot at overthrowing their dictators. So Islamic fundamentalist movements, not just ISIS, but specifically the Islamic Brotherhood, who are more of a political party than, than they're not, they're not a terrorist organization, they're more of a political party, start gaining tremendous power in the Middle East and begin overthrowing dictators. These Islamic movements are going to gather and organize using social media, specifically Twitter. The thing with Twitter is you've got millions of people on Twitter tweeting each other faster than dictators and their governments can remove the tweets. So by the time these countries have shut down the internet and shut down Twitter, it's too late. These organizations are already in place, and they're overthrowing countries. So that's the Arab Spring. Using social media, people led by Islamic fundamentalist organizations like the Islamic Brotherhood, start overthrowing dictatorships throughout the Middle East. So that is one kind of positive outcome of social media. It gives people a way to overthrow bad guys. Another effect of social media, the 2016 coup in Turkey. So this past summer, summer of 2016, kind of the opposite happened in Turkey. The Turkish, mil the Turkish military was afraid of a growing Islamic movement in Turkey, tried to engage in a coup in Turkey. They tried to overthrow the government and take charge. So they tried to establish a dictatorship. They quickly occupy the major cities. So Istanbul being one of the major cities. Um, protests and riots break out pretty quick. And next thing you know, people hop on Twitter and start tweeting about all of the riots and protesting taking place. And then more people are hearing about the riots and protesting. And then they jump out 
into the riots and protesting, and then they get bigger, and then they get bigger, and then they get bigger. The president of Turkey, so a guy who was freely elected, he's in hiding. He's afraid the military is going to try and assassinate him. He gets on Facebook Live and sends a video out to the Turkish people trying to end the coup. Says, hey, go protest, go riot, let's end this. It works. Turkish military coup fails. So two examples of social media having huge effects on politics in developing countries. Let's talk about fake news. If you have not heard about Pizzagate, where I'm going to give you the short and skinny on it real quick. So the Russian hackers hack the Democratic National Convention's email servers. They get a whole bunch of emails. They put them on WikiLeaks. People are reading them. One of the specific Democrats who emails got leaked was a guy by the name of John Podesta. John Podesta was the chairman of the Hillary Clinton campaign for president. So all of his emails get leaked on WikiLeaks. People are reading his emails. This super weird conspiracy theory ends up getting developed about Podesta. And basically the theory says that Podesta is involved in a pedophilia ring in a pizza shop in Washington, D.C. Totally not true. Totally fake. Super weird. It's going all over Facebook, all over Twitter, all over Instagram. Everybody's talking about it. It's hitting the national news. Even though it's fake, people are talking about it because it's crazy. Well, this guy by the name of Edgar Welch, who lives not too far away in Salisbury, he believes the theory. He thinks it's true. He thinks those dirty, dirty Democrats are doing very, very bad things in pizza shops in Washington, D.C. So he takes his trusty old AR-15, as seen in this picture, and he goes to Washington, D.C., and he decides to shoot up the pizza shop, which he does. But apparently, not only is he stupid, but he's a bad shot, too. No one is injured. So, the problem with news on social media is that news on social media has not been vetted by experts. This guy thought it was real because he read it on Facebook. He didn't go on Fox News or CNN or, or NPR or any reputable news sites and verify that what he was reading was true. He saw it on Facebook and he believed it. And then he acted like a crazy person and decided to shoot up a pizza store. Not smart. So if there's a lesson to be learned here, it is this. If you see something on Facebook, don't believe it. Google it. Then believe it. Always verify the source. Answer your daily objectives.